We'll get started in about one minute. So good evening from the Cancer Survivors Park in downtown Greenville. Um, we're coming to you from the Center of Hope and Healing uh, in the middle of the Cancer Survivors Park. Um, came down tonight, uh, the dogwoods are blooming, uh, a lot of the perennials are coming out of the ground. It's a, just a beautiful place to be. Um, and so uh, please visit uh, often um, for uh, your remembrance of survivors as well as your celebration of survivors. Um, a few housekeeping events. First of all, I'm Dr. Jeff Jaguer and I'm your host for um, the monthly cancer prevention and wellness lecture. Um, these um, lectures occur uh, the um, second Thursday of each month. Um, so uh, tune in and tell your friends about it. Uh, a few housekeeping uh, things. Uh, everybody will be muted on the call. Um, we will have uh, questions at the end that you can submit via the um, chat option. Um, this is uh, an interactive uh, lecture that we will be recording and will be available for future viewing. Uh, and you can refer the future viewing to your friends as well uh, via the cancersurvivorspark.org uh, website. Um, tonight, we're honored to have with us uh, Dr. Mary Britton Blankenship, um, who is a private uh, integrative medicine uh, specialist at Spruce MD. Uh, she is a board certified internal medicine specialist, uh, as well as completing a fellowship um, in, uh, and, and board uh, certified in integrative health and, and medicine. Uh, in addition to her professional life, uh, she's an exercise enthusiast. She's a wife and mother of three. Um, Dr. Blankenship is going to um, talk about defining integrative medicine and its role in cancer prevention. Um, this is uh, designed, uh, the spirit of this is to be an informal lecture, interactive. I will ask questions along the way. Uh, Dr. Uh, Blankenship certainly um, uh, deserves her uh, professional uh, credentials, but uh, she will uh, talk to me as Jeff, and I will talk to her as Mary Britton or Mary B, as she prefers. So, Dr. Blankenship, if you could take it from here, thanks for being with us tonight. Yes, good evening, and thank you for having me. So, I was asked to speak at this event on integrative practices for cancer prevention. So that's what we're gonna focus on. So as Jeff mentioned, I am the founder and physician at Spruce MD Integrative Medicine. I am first and foremost an internal medicine physician, but have also done advanced training in integrative medicine. So you may, if you've been following along with some of these lectures, know the um, staggering statistics with regards to cancer. Um, these estimates are for the year 2021, and we know that cancer is a major public health problem worldwide. It's the second leading cause of death in the United States. And in fact, in 2020, the diagnosis and treatment of cancer was actually slowed and hampered a bit by COVID-19. And this was because Patients were not going in for screening. Um, they were not following up on some of their um, cancer regimens because of facilities being closed or fear of contracting COVID. So it's estimated that approximately 2 million new cancer diagnoses will be made in 2021. 39.5% of men and women will be diagnosed with cancer at some point during their lifetimes, which is a really um, kind of a mind-blowing number to think about. 
In this schematic here, we're looking at the estimated new cases for both men and women. So for males, the top cancers are prostate, lung, and, and bronchus, and then colorectal cancers. For women, it's breast, lung, and bronchus, and then also colorectal cancer. And then when we're looking at deaths, um, for males, again, lung and bronchus, prostate, colorectal, the order switches a little bit. Same for women. So that order um, for deaths is about the same as far as incidents. And these are the projected 2021 statistics. So these are high numbers, and this is concerning, but I think we're all here tonight to discuss what we can actually do uh, with regards to preventative measures to prevent cancer becoming one of your own personal diagnoses. So let's step back a minute and talk about what integrative medicine actually is. So I like to tell my patients and, and friends and family who ask um, what exactly integrative medicine is that I consider it a marriage between conventional medicine and then alternative practices. So I certainly prescribe prescriptive medications. I recommend um, procedures, screening modalities, but then coupled with that, we might focus a lot on lifestyle changes, nutrition, physical activity. Um, we might use supplements as a first option for treatment instead of going directly to a prescriptive medication. But essentially, integrative medicine really focuses on prevention as a tenet of health. Uh, focuses on personalized care, so no treatment plan is the same for any patient, and then really works to get to the root cause of medical issues. So not just providing band-aids for symptoms, but digging deeper to find out what truly is causing symptoms. So when we talk about integrative me medicine in regards to cancer prevention, there are five areas of focus that we think about. So nutrition, physical activity, stress management, environmental health, and then sleep. Um, these certainly are, are, are good things to focus on for overall health, but tonight we're really gonna focus on the specifics of cancer prevention. So the first um, area we're gonna speak on tonight is nutrition. And this is probably the biggest area and the biggest um, place where you can make the most change to prevent cancer. So we know that there are some foods that directly increase the risk of cancer. So we think about alcohol. Alcohol increases the risk of head and neck cancer, esophageal, colorectal, liver, breast, and stomach cancers. Red meat increases the risk of colorectal cancer as does processed meat. So when we think about alcohol, the recommended limits on intake of alcohol for women is five drinks a week. For men, that's seven drinks a week. And for women, it should be no more than one drink in a sitting. And for men, no more than two drinks in a sitting. Um, we know that heavy alcohol consumers uh, usually show inadequate intake of many essential nutrients. We think about B12, we think about magnesium, and also folic acid, which actually is crucial for DNA synthesis and repair. So if you don't have adequate folic acid stores, uh, then your genomic stability is hampered. Um, we also know that menopause, and there have been studies that, that show that menopause and alcohol actually increase the risk of breast cancer. And then when we think about processed meats, we're talking about ham, we're talking about deli meat, bacon, hot dogs, and these types of meat contain nitrates and nitrites that help keep them, they make, essentially make them process and help keep them fresher and longer. So these n nitroso chemicals form, and these actually will damage the bowel wall, which then can lead to colorectal cancer. They also can contain heterocyclic amines and polycyclic amines, which are produced when meat is cooked at high temperature. So you think about charring meat, and especially red meats on the grill, and that char is what contains those heterocyclic and polycyclic amines. So we think about foods that then can directly decrease your risk of cancer. We think about whole grains, dietary fiber, and di dietary fiber being plentiful in vegetables and fruits and really helping to keep that microbiota in your gut healthy. Um, and in turn, they can decrease your risk of colorectal cancer. Soy is here and it's here in italics because there is some controversial um, research on soy, but in some studies it has shown to decrease the risk of breast cancer. Um, this is been most pronounced in Asian cultures where they consume higher amounts of soy. 
Now we also know and studies have shown that greater body fatness increases your risk of cancer. So if we think about foods that indirectly increase your cancer risk by contributing to weight gain and obesity, we think about fast foods or like our standard American diet, uh, the SAD diet, Western diet. Um, and typically these diets are um, full of fried foods, processed foods, um, essentially devoid of vegetables and fruits. So there might be a lot of things that are coming from a bag, from a bag or a box. Additionally, sugar sweetened drinks also can e increase body fatness. So we think about sodas, sweet tea, juice, um, and those are things that can increase weight. And with increased weight, we know that that can increase cancer. Um, diets that do indirectly decrease cancer risk by decreasing weight, weight gain and obesity um, that have been studied most extensively uh, is the Mediterranean type diet. So when we think about a diet or a nutrition plan for cancer prevention, we think about adhering to a Mediterranean type diet or plant-based diet, which I talk a lot about with my patients. Um, both of these diets include lots of vegetables and fruits. So you think about a plate that is very colorful, has um, a variety of vegetables and fruits, um, limited amounts of animal protein so that the brightly colored foods on your plate are what are in abundance. Lots of whole grains. So we think about um, brown rice and quinoa, farro, some of those ancient grains that have health benefits. Lots of nuts and seeds with all of those good fatty acids and then using good oils like olive oil and avocado oil and then certainly staying really well hydrated. And these two diets, the things we think about, and I don't like to call them diets, I really actually hate that term, but thinking more about um, a way of eating or nutrition plan, but limiting animal protein. So animal protein, especially when it's conventionally raised, is really high in omega-6 fatty acids. And omega-6 fatty acids um, can really increase underlying inflammation, which in turn can cause a lot of chronic diseases, but also uh, can increase risk of cancer. So limiting animal protein, that doesn't mean you have to become a vegetarian or have to become a vegan, but thinking, rethinking what your meals look like. So lots of vegetables and a side of animal protein. Or maybe you're having something like a meatless Monday every now and then. Um, but really in a, a America, we're, we're heavily focused on protein content and inclusion, including that in our diets. But really, um, I think we're more deficient in dietary fiber. So thinking about having animal protein, not three meals a day, but maybe three times a week and, and how that could um, be switched up a little bit from your daily plan. Limiting vegetable oils. So we think about peanut oils and sunflower vegetable oils are, are typically processed and they're gonna have more of those um, inflammatory omega-6 fatty acids as well. You think about limiting refined flours and sugar. So anything that is white typically has um, some sort of refined grain or refined sugar in it. And then alcohol, which we covered in detail before. So your meals could look something like this. So this is a plant-based meal that has lots of color to it. You have carrots and broccoli. You have um, a grain that looks like brown rice. You have some peanuts and soy for your protein and some cabbage. Um, so a very filling meal with lots of protein, but it's not from animal protein. And it's very colorful with lots of vegetables in it. It could look something like this. So this has yogurt on top. That's animal protein, but it's not the centerpiece of the meal, this lentil stew. Tacos could look a little different. So maybe use chickpea as your protein as opposed to carne asada, um, but lots of vegetables included instead of lots of cheese. Here's another great bowl. Again, just recognizing the colorfulness of each of these um, options. So variety is key. Your gut likes variety. All of those microbes and microorganisms, they're kind of picky and they want different things. And so if you're constantly feeding them trash, they're not flourishing and in turn, they're not keeping your gut healthy. So meals might look a little less like this. So this is kind of a standard um, meal that we might have on a regular occasion, but you can see how it's bland. The only thing with any color really is ketchup and an egg yolk, um, but otherwise it's pretty bland. So if you're I guess as my mother used to say, if you have a beige plate, 
you need to go back to the kitchen. You're missing something. So your, your plate shouldn't be beige. It should have lots of colors. And if it is, you need to rethink perhaps what's on it. Ketchup doesn't count either, by the way. And then we have dessert options. So yeah, these are fun to look at, but essentially have zero nutritive value and honestly are just spiking your blood sugar and creating underlying inflammation and turmoil. So Mary B, um, in your intro, I said you're the mother of three. So what does dessert look like in the Blankenship household? Yeah, so we certainly have dessert. I will say we try to make better decisions about dessert. So I think dark chocolate is actually a fantastic treat. So 70% cacao or higher. Um, my kids have dessert. They go to birthday parties. They have birthday cakes. They um, have things when they're out, but it's not something we regularly have in our household. We don't have any packaged sweets. We enjoy homemade treats. Um, and those are the things we enjoy. And I think that we as parents um, kind of have to think about that. It's easy to kind of give in and hand over and um, uh, concede to some of those wishes sometimes, but we are us ultimately shaping our kids' um, future and how they approach food. And so sometimes we have to, even we do as, as providers, keep that in check of, you know, what am I doing for my family? Is that the right thing? But yes, we totally So, so what you fix for you and your husband is the same thing you fix for the children. Exactly. Yeah. I tell them I am not a short order cook. I do not have time for that. There's one meal prepared. And <laughs> no, then it, you do not have time for that. Right? It is a long time till breakfast if you don't eat dinner. So they usually eat. And we also say, and, it, and I can't remember, my husband heard this on NPR. I think it's actually Dr. Yum, which is a great resource for parents. If you guys want to check that out, Dr. Yum, I think she's a pediatrician, but you cannot, you can't allow your kids to say they don't like something. They have to say they're still practicing it. Um, so my kids are still practicing a lot of things, but they have to try them all. So Dr. Yum is you, is why you am. Yeah. yeah. It's a great okay. resource for parents. Um, and That's she's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, share that with your other people. Yeah. Yeah. For I'm sure. sorry. Proceed. All Thank right. You. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is physical activity and its importance in cancer prevention. So in exercise decreases cancer risk. We know that there is an inverse association between physical activity and cancer incidence. It, it, it leads to a 25% reduction in risk of breast cancer among those who are most physically active when compared to those who are least so. And then there's an inverse association between kidney cancer and physical activity. And then we also know from research that there's a protective role of exercise in decreasing lung, endometrial, colon, and possibly prostate cancer. So if we look at this list and then we think back to that first um, graph I showed you, these are all the top cancers. So these are all the cancers that are highest or a lot of them in men and women. And we think that physical activity and movement could decrease that risk, um, then it might all get us out here on the trail. There's lots of people behind me right now. So the American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes or two and a half hours of moderate intensity aerobic activity. So we think about moderate intensity, we think about maybe you're walking, maybe it's a slow jog, an easy spin on a bike, um, something like Tai Chi or um, gentler movement. For more this more vigorous intensity aerobic activity, so 75 minutes recommended of that per week, uh, we're thinking more about a good, a run at a good pace or a more strenuous bike ride or a HIIT workout, high intensity interval training. Um, and the idea is that you spread it throughout the week, that you're not just going on a 75 minute run one day and then you're doing nothing for the rest of the week, but really spreading out that time. So it is also recommended that you add moderate to high intensity muscle strengthening activity on at least two days. So some weight lifting, it can be with weights or your body weight. And then we also know that you gain more benefits by being active at least 300 minutes or five hours per week. Um, and then spend less time sitting. So movement um, in even light activity can offset some of the risk of being sedentary. So I often recommend to my patients, you know, exercise, sure. It's really important to get your heart rate up, but also move. And those things don't have to be exclusive of each other. So we don't know the extent of the association between sitting and cancer, um, but we do know from current studies that regular exercise 
may not ameliorate the deleterious effects of prolonged sitting. So that raises some concern. So if you're an office worker who goes for a 10 mile run in the morning, but then you're sitting at your desk all day, um, you may not have a decreased risk of cancer. So the objective is to exercise, get your heart rate up, but also move. So exercise can look really different. It can be different from everyone. So you have CrossFit, high, you know, really strenuous workouts. You have cycling, and this looks like a more intense cycling session, but you could go on an easy bike ride. Um, and this looks more like Tai Chi or dancing. It can be fun. So it can be hiking or walking with your kids, a pickup basketball game, um, or even getting out for a swim. And you can see these people, um, these swimmers are not all swimming laps necessarily, but they're moving. They even have, some of them have life jackets on. And so the point is that you're getting lots of movement in this activity um, spread throughout the week. Yeah, so Mary Britton, I just want to uh, make sure that we stress, I mean, we, we both see uh, older patients, uh, patients who have other health problems. Uh, everybody's familiar after COVID of with the term comorbidities. <clears throat> um, a lot of these pictures, I mean, they look like world-class athletes, not so much the people in the in the lake with the life jackets, but uh, how do we uh, suggest that these people to get their exercise in modify so within their, their um, capabilities? Sure. So I think the first thing is to find something that you resonate with. So if you don't like it, you're not going to do it. Um, and I think the second thing is to find something that you like and that you are capable of doing, capable of doing with your current activity level. So if that's just walking around the block, that's okay. If it's sitting in a stationary bike, that's great. If it is um, water aerobics, that's going to be gentler on your joints. And that's a great option. I even tell some of my patients who swear they can't do anything and they hate every option of exercise that have a dance party in your room, close the door. No one has to see you crank up some music and rock out for a little bit. And you can even do that sitting. Um, but I think you can get creative. So there's lots of different ways to move. And I think there are lots of different levels of activity. I think yoga and Tai Chi are two of the really good options for those who right. want to be a little gentler. So make sure that you dance like nobody's watching. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next thing we're going to talk about is stress and how stress can affect cancer risk. So stress-related psychosocial stressors can have an adver adverse effect on cancer instance prognosis and mortality. Stressful life experiences are related to decreased survival and increased mortality in those with cancer, which is pretty interesting. So when we talk about stress, there's several different things we consider. So we think about major life events. So uh, a divorce, a death in the family, maybe caregiver stress. We think about personality and coping styles having, having an effect. So if you have a very angry personality or hopelessness or some sort of personality disorder, it may affect the way you deal with stress. And then there is emotional stress. So depression, anxiety, exhaustion, or just even poor life satisfaction. We know that short lasting psychosocial stress activities activate, sorry, excuse me, activates the sympathetic nervous system. So catecholamines like adrenaline and noradrenaline are secreted, which can then have a beneficial effect. So if you have, if you go on a run, a hard run, you're going to have, um, that's a stressful event, but it's in a good way. This is going to benefit your body. However, long lasting persistent psychosocial stress or high levels of stress. So let's say that you live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of crime and you are constantly being stressed uh, or living in a stressful situation, or you're going to a job every day that is incredibly stressful. This can lead to biological, psychological, and even behavioral changes, and then in turn have adverse health effects. Um, we also know that there are other mediators like glucocorticoids um, or cortisol, for example, that participate in tumor growth and metastasis. So um, stress can actually have a profound, profound effect on, on cancer risk. We know that um, stress weakens the immune system. You think about how important your immune system is if you're trying to um, prevent yourself from having cancer or even going through treatment of cancer. It affects DNA repair, um, inhibits cellular aging, and then prevents apoptosis or cell death. So all- well, Mary, 
but I'm sorry, go ahead and finish. No, I said yeah. All of these things are important for, for cancer prevention um, or preventing tumors from growing. So stress, I mean, you can have an ideal body weight and you can exercise, but, but stress is something <clears throat> in every life uh, that we just can't avoid. Some, some lives are worse uh, than others. And I suspect that of your appointments, um, a majority of the symptoms that you're dealing with are directly related to stress. So I, I think this is where integrative um, medicine uh, and integrative oncology has its, has its biggest influence. And, and that's what can you tell our, the patients and what can we tell our fellow men and, and women uh, how to de-stress? Yeah, exactly. And, and to your point, I have that conversation with every patient because it is a huge driver of so many chronic diseases or symptoms. Um, I actually have a slide right here. So we'll talk through that. So here you can see stress basically affects every organ system in your body and how um, stress can be felt in so many different ways. Um, but when we talk about stress, and I do this a lot with my patients, we talk about stress management. So what can we do from for a routine um, prophylactic preventative stress management management approach. So the things we talk about, or I talk about with patients are exercise. So exercise in the moment we talked about a while ago can be stressful, but it has a long lasting um, stress reducing benefit. So getting up in the morning, exercising before you go to a stressful job is going to make that more doable and your stress levels are going to be lower because you're already in a good place. Meditation is a great way to prevent stress um, from being overwhelming. Getting out in nature, there's actually a, um, an ancient Japanese practice called forest bathing, where you basically go out into nature and it can be anywhere, typically a forest, obviously, but you go out into nature and I'll do this to my kids sometimes, but you, you don't say anything. You, you observe what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you feel, and you basically are becoming more uh, one with the, the environment that you were in. And then afterwards, like I always talk about it with my kids, like, what did you hear? what did you see? And it's amazing once we slow down and let ourselves slow down what we appreciate. So being out in the nature is a huge one um, and a huge one for me um, specifically. Journaling is a great way for stress management. Even a gratitude journal of just noting three things you're grateful for each day can kind of put you in a different mindset. Prayer is a great stress management tool and yoga is as well. It's a form of meditation. So these are the things we recommend as kind of preventive. You should do one of these every day to lower stress levels. But then we have these, what I call abort mission techniques. So stress is really high. You're at work. You are um, almost a panic mode or just feeling so overwhelmed. The kids are yelling. It's been a rough day and you need something in the moment to kind of lower your cortisol levels and get to a, to a better place. So breath work is great. There's several breathing techniques and those are great back pocket tools to pull out anywhere. Um, there's four, seven, eight breathing, there's box breathing, there's some great apps as well. I think you can do some of the breath work or meditation on headspace and calm apps. Exercise is a great um, abort mission technique. And I always joke about this, but my husband, I think, figured out before I did that exercise was my abort mission technique. And anytime I was like high stress or potentially in a bad mood, he would send me out on a run. And I'd come back and I'd be like, hey, yeah, what, what's wrong? And he's like, okay, good. <laughs> We're a lot better. But exercise can be a great way to kind of turn um, a stressful situation around. Take five. So just stepping away for five minutes whether that's um, walking around the office or talking to the coworker or making a phone call, getting outside. And then the, the next one is actually getting outside. So again, getting in nature. So work is stressful, kids are stressful, get out, reset, come back in, um, and you're gonna be in a better place. So box breathing is a technique I do with my patients a lot. And um, sometimes we'll do it in practice. And I thought we might do a couple of rounds of that tonight. So you guys can all do this at home. Um, but what we're gonna do, so what box breathing is, is you inhale for four counts and you hold for four counts. You forcefully exhale for four counts and you hold for four counts. And so you're visualizing this box as you work through the breathing technique. So we'll do a couple of rounds together and then you guys can use it on your own, whatever. All right, so inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, exhale, two, three, four, 
hold, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four. And you can do that about 10 times. So 10 rounds of it and you'll be in a, in a, in a different place. And it's, it's great when you feel it building up. It's great before bedtime when your, your mind is racing and you don't feel like you can go to sleep. Um, speaking of, the next thing we're going to talk about is sleep and sleep's role in cancer prevention. So sleep deprivation um, is associated with decreased natural killer cells. Sleep disrupt disruption and circadian rhythm disruption have pro-inflammatory effects and melatonin is a free radical scavenger. So all of these things are important for, for cancer prevention. Um, sleep disruption also impacts hormone levels. And we know that a lot of those top uh, cancers that we looked at are driven by hormones. So it's recommended that adults get seven to eight hours of sleep nightly. So how do we do that? Are we all getting seven to eight hours? Um, Sleep hygiene is the first thing to kind of consider. If you are having trouble sleeping, having trouble with insomnia, um, you might want to look at what your, your sleep hygiene looks like. So this starts kind of midday. So midday, you don't want to have any coffee after 2 p.m. So you're kind of already early afternoon setting yourself up for good sleep at night. You want to avoid alcohol two hours before bedtime and then stop eating one and a half hours to two hours before bedtime. So the reason for this is you don't wanna have high blood sugars right when you're going to sleep. Uh, you don't wanna have uh, alcohol right before bed because we know that alcohol disrupts deep sleep and it fractures your sleep. The half-life of alcohol is six hours. And so you think about when you're consuming that. I'm sorry, the half-life of uh, caffeine is six hours. The alcohol stays in your system as well and can fracture your sleep. Uh, you want to turn off screen. So this means phone, this means computer, TV, tablet, Apple Watch. I mean, this list goes on and on. Um, but turn it off 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime because that blue light can also be very stimulating. It can prevent you from going to sleep, but it also disrupts your sleep and can fracture your sleep in the nighttime. You want to start dimming your lights around 8 p.m. So, you know, start turning off some lights, make it a little darker so that your melatonin can kick in and you start to feel a little sleepy. And then you want to have a very regular bedtime routine. So what are you doing? Um, brushing your teeth, washing your face, have patients who like to take a bath every single night, have patients who do stretching exercises before bed, but really think about what your routine is and making it the same every night. So your body is programmed to know it's time to go to bed. Keep your room cooled to 65 degrees Fahrenheit or colder, and then keep it completely dark. So no TV on, no TV preferentially in the room at all, but no TV on, um, no nightlight, no other lights in the closet, curtains drawn so that's completely dark. So your melatonin really ramps up. So if you are struggling with insomnia, we think about potential causes. So sleep apnea is a big one. If you're a snorer, sleep apnea could be interrupting your sleep at night and causing a lot of daytime fatigue. Also think about um, light sleepers. So if, if I have patients who are light sleepers, I might recommend a sound machine or earplugs um, because those little ones in the house or the dog in the bed or the husband or wife who's snoring um, or the busy cars outside are waking them up. Restless legs. So if you are struggling with restless leg syndrome, there might be some vitamin testing that needs to be done to see if there's any deficiencies. Um, anxiety certainly can keep patients up at night and cause insomnia. So stress management, like we talked about before, and then disrupted circadian rhythm. So do you work a job that uh, is a night shift or has changing hours? Um, melatonin can be really helpful for these people and blue light blocking glasses as well. So you think about wearing glasses if you're working in a very um, hyper lit hospital, um, which I've done way too many nights that I care to admit, but wearing blue light blocking glasses um, so that you're filtering out some of that light and really working to get your melatonin ramped up for when you are able to go to sleep, you know, early morning or whenever it is. So of course we all want to sleep like a baby. Um, so how would we do this? If you were gonna set up your um, routine and your day so that your sleep was optimized, um, this would be how I would recommend. So you actually- you know, Mary B, I, you know, I, I, you've had 
babies, uh, lately mine are grandbabies. I'm not sure that's a great analogy. <laughs> okay, so maybe not the nighttime wakings, but babies yeah. can sleep in the daytime no, but, and right. nothing bothers them. You know, they don't wake up for anything. So we're going for that like knockout okay. bed sleep where nothing's going to wake you up. So exercising hard um, and exercising in the morning is going to be better to set you up for an easier um, an easier time going to sleep in the evening. If you exercise right before bed, it can actually be stimulating and make it harder to go to sleep. So exercising and preferably in the morning, caffeinate in the morning, in the morning only, practice some form of mindfulness throughout the day and start winding down after dinner. Dim your lights, turn off your devices, read a book like an actual like paper hardback book. Right. Um, establish some sort of meditation, breathing exercise before bed and then slowly fall off into slumber. So those are the ways. If you're a city mouse, I'm sorry, maybe. Uh, if you're a city mouse and there's there's outside noise, is white noise okay? Yeah, I think a sound machine is fantastic for sure. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. And and, then, and and the breathing techniques. I, I mean, when your mind is going and going and going, it just it, you're you're right that 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 breathing technique it did, it does get you to a different place. Yes, you're you're exactly right. I mean, I utilize all these tools too, and could right. not agree more. All right, and the last thing we're gonna talk about is environment. So how does environmental health affect your risk of cancer? So we know that there are several um, toxins in our environment that can increase risk of cancer. So we think about tobacco, we think about it, tobacco containing polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that can increase lung cancer, and then cadmium, which can also increase risk of lung cancer, prostate and kidney cancers. We think about outdoor pollution, air pollution. So this is more problematic in really big cities, but those particulates in the air can increase the risk of lung cancer. We think about organochlorine, so pesticides and insecticides. Um, studies have shown that farmers who work with pesticides have higher rates of prostate cancer, and some women will have higher rates of ovarian cancer. So how can you as a consumer, you know, we, you may not be working with pesticides and insecticides regularly, but um, as a consumer, you know, is there a concern that you're consuming these in food? So trying to buy organic produce and really looking at those lists that show those produce that are most important to buy organic. The Environmental Working Group has a good dirty dozen and clean 15 list. Um, so you can buy those that are highest um, risk of having pesticides organic and then you know save your money on those that do not. And then ultraviolet light. So of course we know that can increase risk of skin cancer. So sun protection being important. And then radon. So radon is a radioactive gas that's released from the decay of the specific elements um, in rocks and soil. So it can seep up through the ground and diffuses into the air. And then the inhalation of radon can damage the cells of the lungs and lead to lung cancer. So this can get trapped in our homes, especially those that are very insulated. So important to have a radon uh, detector to check that or check it periodically. And then asbestos, asbestos is not as common anymore. We still see some of the, those cancers, specifically mesothelioma, lung cancer, laryngeal cancer, ovarian cancer, um, but this results from inhalation of the fibers. Most homes are chucked for asbestos if they're old or homes now. Um, so a, a bit more, less concerning, I should say. And then we think about volatile solvents, so exhaust, air fresheners, paints, and all of these can increase risk of lung cancer as you're breathing in um, these solvents. And then arsenic um, can increase risk of bladder and skin cancer. And arsenic levels can be high in some of our water. So using water purifier, um, chicken can actually have higher levels of arsenic. And then sometimes we think about rice. So again, buying organic and pastured um, products. So we look at this um, schematic of tobacco use and you can see how it can affect all of these different areas of the body and increase all these different types of cancer. So, you know, we potentially are not as exposed to secondhand smoke as much as we were, you know, a decade or two decades ago, um, not allowing smoking indoors and in, in most public spaces. Um, but if you're a smoker or you live with a smoker, you may want to consider um, cutting back or quitting or you know, making it an outside um, thing only. 
And then we also know that there are nutrients that decrease DNA damage. So we think about carotenoids and you can get these from carrots and um, sweet potatoes, but any sort of orange um, vegetable or fruit. You think about CoQ10 and CoQ10 is an antioxidant that your body produces naturally, but it can get depleted with age or decrease with age. And then it can get depleted with certain medications. So we think about statin medication. So if you're taking a statin medication, you may need to supplement with CoQ10 probiotics. Um, so certainly probiotics are important to keep your gut microbiota healthy. And we think about um, foods that contain probiotics such as kefir or yogurt, um, kombucha, um, sauerkraut, kimchi, all those good fermented foods. Quercetin, um, quercetin is a, a flavonoid and it's found pretty commonly in onions and leeks and apples and it can inhibit NF-kappa B which is important um, in preventing cancer. Selenium, selenium is found in high amounts in Brazil nuts. Vitamin C, we think about any sort of citrus fruit. Vitamin E is found plentiful or is plentiful in nuts and seeds and leafy greens, avocados. Vitamin D, we get mostly from the sun, but I would say 60, 70% of my patients actually are vitamin D deficient. Um, and then we think about plant phenols. So these are micronutrients and vegetables and fruits, just another reason to, in, to include a lot of um, plants in your diet. So then we also think about the master antioxidant glutathione. So glutathione really works to remove damaged DNA, um, which is what we want, uh, especially as we, we all would prefer to avoid cancer as a diagnosis. So production of glutathione decreases after age 45, but there are foods um, that can support healthy levels. So some of these are listed here. We think about grapefruit and asparagus and avocado, um, melon, strawberries. And then there are spices uh, that also contain flavonoids that can increase glutathione. So turmeric, and many of you may know that turmeric or curcumin is a good anti-inflammatory. Cinnamon um, and cardamom are two other really good ones. So Mary Britton, before you get to that, um, you, you're, you're shopping for your family. Do, do you just go to the normal um, grocery stores or do you do um, some specialized store shopping or do you do some specialized store shopping on occasion or do you go to the farmer's market or how do you do this? No, that's a great question. So I typically try to buy as much as I can locally. So we know that local produce um, is going to have more vitamins and nutrients because it hasn't traveled all the way across the country or from another country and lost a lot of that nutritive value. So I try to buy as much as I can locally. And then um, I will get a lot of that from farmers markets or local farmers. I think we're really lucky here in um, South Carolina with all the local farms and the availability of produce. Um, so farmers markets and then the Swamp Rabbit Cafe is always and grocery is always a great resource to get um, local produce, but also um, grass fed meats. Uh, so that's a good resource as well. So I would say shopping is a little complicated because we try to buy local first and then we'll go elsewhere for the other stuff. Um, so it's not a one-stop shop, but that's how we approach our, our, our grocery list. Now, can you send your husband out for this with confidence? Yes. He does a lot of the grocery shopping. Wow. Good for him. That's a, that's a, that's a shout out right there. <laughs> He's a good wife. Yeah. Right. All right, and then the last thing, the last, last thing, because I told you I was already gonna be the last thing, but this is not as part of maybe integrated, but certainly important for cancer prevention from any viewpoint in any respect. So screening is really important. So you wanna make sure that you're staying on top of mammograms, pelvic exams, pap smears, colorectal screening, whether that's colonoscopy or coligard or flex uh, SIG, plus or minus PSA. So that's a conversation you need to have with your physician whether you want to test that or not. And then annual labs. So I think every patient should have certain labs done, but we wanna make sure that your hemoglobin A1C or your blood sugar looks good so that you aren't increasing inflammation from high blood sugar, inflammatory markers, vitamin D, and then really keeping your BMI and body composition in check. So that's another thing that providers will monitor and look into for you. But this is the thing I appreciate about integrative medicine, integrative oncology, um, 
we don't disavow conventional medicine. It's just that we incorporate it and we find that we have a lot of capabilities to heal ourselves and um, we're not necessarily as integrative medicine practitioners reaching for a prescription pad um, as the first go, go thing. So, um, and I think that's, that's how we're gonna save the health system and, and save each other, so. No, I think that's a, a very important point is that medicine saves lives, but there's a there's an appropriate place for it. And I think that, yeah, screening techniques and all of this technology that we have at our fingertips is important um, and should be utilized. And I think we also have to tap into all the tools we have ourselves and what we can do from a, a lifestyle um, standpoint and making sure we're, we're staying on top of things as well. All right, so that was a lot of information. So how do we put all of this together? So if I were to write a prevention prescription um, for cancer, it would include eating a clean whole food diet that's full of fresh local vegetables and fruits, keep alcohol consumption in check, exercise five days a week, but then also moving every 30 minutes. Avoid common toxins. And I think an easy way to start is to buy organic produce for those things that have higher pesticide count and use a water filter. Start a mindfulness practice. So whatever you resonate with, start incorporating it. Get seven to eight hours of sleep nightly and then see your physician regularly. And then you got to find joy too. So is that you? It's not me. It's not me. But oh. you know, you asked me that the other day and I almost pulled a picture um, of myself doing that because it's my, it's my typical jump move. Yeah. So yeah, it's fair to say that you have a greater... Um, um, leap uh, radius than, than I do, uh, a, be, a better altitude than I do. So um, yeah, that, that's pretty, that, and it says joy too. Exactly. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about Spruce MD. You know, where does the word come from? What's your practice like? Yeah, so, so Spruce MD, so where the name originated. So I moved here from Salt Lake City, uh, originally from Alabama, but moved here from Salt Lake City. Um, where I did a lot of my training and then worked for a while. And really, I already had an appreciation for the outdoors, but really fell in love with the outdoors. And so I wanted to bring the outdoors to my practice because I do think, as I've mentioned a few times already, nature is healing. So I wanted something that resonated with nature and, and my loves. And I think it has the added benefit of sprucing up your health. Um, presently, we are located in Venture Axo in West Greenville. And um, we have, so it's myself and we have a registered dietitian and a health coach on staff right now. Um, but we're growing fast and we're presently looking to hire a new physician. So stay tuned about that part. But yeah, if you are interested in care, um, contact information is included there. So, um, you know, in your life, you have the uh, periodic curmudgeon um, who would say, okay, I get eight hours of sleep. I wake up, they make me drink kale juice. Then I go on a 10 mile run. Uh, that sounds miserable. Um, you know, I'd rather have a little less life, but a quality of life. Um, I mean, I don't know. Those probably are not people that are coming to your practice, but they live around you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how, how do you answer to that? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I am always seeking for is the why. Why would you want to do something different? And if you don't have a why, you're not going to make a change. And so that's always what I am digging for with patients. And I think that's what typically will motivate them to do something differently. So yeah, I have those patients who are very skeptical at the beginning and maybe they haven't been to the doctor in forever. Um, but once we tap into why they want to make changes, um, then we can, we can sneak some things in. So, you know, I don't think that you have to go for a run every day. Some people actually really hate running and that's okay, but you can find some sort of activity, which is where I, you know, come in with like the dance party that you enjoy. Um, same with food. You don't like raw vegetables. That's okay. Let's roast them. Let's do something delicious and have a, a very healthy sauce on top. And I don't think it means you have to, you know, turn into this very strict um, uh, person, but I think there's ways to kind of creep um, better habits in, in all areas. And it's not a good quality of life if you're doing those things probably in the end. Right. 
no, it is it is life, but uh, in name only. Um, so we've seen these chronic diseases and it's a miserable existence. So uh, I don't see anything in the chat uh, box right now. Uh, just to remind folks, this will be recorded. Uh, it takes Zoom about 24 hours. So it's going to be probably uh, Monday of next week before this lecture is available on our website. Again, that's cancersurvivorspark.org. Um, but it's, it's really been one of the most informative lectures we've had in our two years of being here. And I very much appreciate the preparation and the delivery and all the information that you imparted, um, Dr. Blankenship. So thank you for being here. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And thank you guys for coming. So um, just some, some other housekeeping. Uh, we do have a, um, uh, an April talk uh, that will occur on April 8th. Uh, and um, just from the standpoint uh, to tell you spring is here and this is a public service announcement. So we do spring forward on Sunday morning. So um, uh, less hour, uh, less of an hour. Um, but April um, is gonna be a, a wonderful time to, to get started on planning your, your summer vegetable garden for an interactive and for an interactive uh, learning discussion on uh, planning a garden for cancer uh, prevention. Um, one of our nurse navigators at the Center for Integrative Oncology and Survivorship, uh, Stephanie Hoops will go over herbs and vegetables known to help decrease your cancer risk. Um, Beth, best methods to plant in a variety of spaces, uh, even uh, closed, uh, not, not very ample spaces, uh, the proper water and sunlight recommendations and uh, common obstacles and tips as to when to reap your harvest. Uh, so um, Stephanie's really uh, very good and very knowledgeable about this. And I think it would be a, a helpful thing. And gardening is a, a wonderful uh, way um, for exercise as well. So, and uh, obviously it gets you out in nature. Um, so a couple of things that um, Dr. Blankenship has emphasized uh, can occur with gardening uh, too. And uh, as is our routine, uh, I normally end with some kind of uh, quote or word or poem. Um, this is um, actually um, something that you probably may have seen, but it's 20, 26 things that we are completely in charge of, they're completely under our control. And um, this was written by Caleb uh, L.P. Gunner, who is an American poet, um, a young American poet. Um, so these are the 26 things that you're entirely in charge of. Your beliefs, your attitude, your thoughts, your perspective, how honest you are, who your friends are, what books you read, how often you exercise, the type of food you eat, how many risks you take, how you interpret the situation, how kind you are to others, how kind you are to yourself, how often you say, I love you, how often you say, thank you, how often you express your feelings, whether or not you ask for help, how often you practice gratitude, how many times you smile today, the amount of effort you put forth, how you spend and invest your time and money, how much time you spend worrying, how often you think about your past, whether or not you judge other people, whether or not you try again after a setback and how much you appreciate the things you have. So until next month, everybody be well, be healthy. Hopefully COVID is going away and we'll all be together soon. Good night.